Hi, welcome to World Civilizations up to 1500. Now, we're starting session three of this topic and we're going to continue looking at the dawn of empires. Uh, we're going to finish the Neo-Babylonian uh, Empire and then we're going to be moving into the Indo-European empires, the Hittites and the Persians. And then we're going to look briefly at the Egyptian Empire. And after we cover that, then we're going to conclude this session and this topic with the Hebrews. Uh, that will be the last segment that we're going to cover. All right, so let us go to uh, our slide to look at the Neo-Babylonian uh, Empire that was attempting to create a uh, religious cult uh, devoted to the moon god, for example. We looked at that. It kind of was a failed attempt to kind of provide unity and cohesion to the empire. Um, now, it is at this time in the history of empires, again, this is really a series of empires uh, that are uh, emerging, and they rise and fall uh, rather quickly in the Near East, in the Mesopotamian region. But at this point, in the, during the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Chaldean uh, Empire, uh, we're going to see uh, the attempt for this empire to try to uh, control the environment, control nature. Uh, to a certain degree, because remember, uh, in the Near East, there is really a worldview centered on the notion that uh, the world is very, very chaotic, very unpredictable, uh, is full of dangers. And that is primarily because the gods who live in the mountains send the floods and send uh, catastrophes from time to time to destroy cities. And again, this really provides a very unstable uh, system in the region. Uh, and at this time, the Neo-Babylonian leaders are attempting to gain some grip uh, to, uh, to nature, trying to understand nature, how it works, and perhaps even trying to control the environment to a certain degree. So this is, again, a turning point uh, in the history of humans dealing with nature and dealing with the environment, so to speak. And the way that the Neo-Babylonians uh, concluded that uh, they were able to have some control over nature was by understanding the timing of those catastrophes and the floods and the like. And after spending significant time observing the night sky uh, year after year, uh, in this process they develop a science called astronomy, you know, the science of celestial bodies and knowing the cycles of the sun, the moon, and of, and of course the planets as well, they concluded that celestial events, you know, the planets, for, for example, or solar and lunar eclipses had a direct effect on the Earth. That those catastrophes that happened from time to time in nature were not uh, erratic. Those were not unpredictable events sent by the gods necessarily, but rather that those were actually influences or effects by the celestial bodies, in other words. So again, there's a direct relationship between the sky and the earth, according to the Neo-Babylonians. And so they noticed, for example, that whenever there was a solar eclipse, uh, soon thereafter there will be a drought, for example, or after a lunar eclipse there will be a flood, for example, or that uh, certain planets that came close to one another in the sky and so, somewhat kind of clash, so to speak, also produce events here on Earth, such as, for example, plagues or uh, wars will break out and so on. So they started making correlations between earthly phenomenon, earthly events, and, of course, celestial uh, phenomena as well. And so they started really charting the sky for that matter, paying very close attention to those cycles. You know, how often does the solar eclipse happen uh, or the lunar eclipse and also the planets, the cycles of the planets. They started really formulating calendars uh, with mathematical precision in order to predict, again, that's the key word, predict future events, that you could indeed predict when a flooding was going to happen, that this was not happening randomly, you know, by the... Uh, capricious uh, designs and whims of the gods, but rather that this was something that uh, was happening as a result of uh, a cosmic uh, order, 
so to speak. So we're going to have now a better understanding of the planets, for example, in the night sky, their cycles, their influences on the eclipses, because by the way, every eclipse uh, is influenced by different planets, by the way. The time that the eclipse takes place is very much influenced by the planet that stands behind uh, the sun, for example. So they're making very accurate, if you will, uh, charts, planetary charts, in order to predict weather, for example, to, pre pre to predict catastrophes, to predict wars, and so on. Again, they're forming those calendars. They're also charting, of course, uh, the stars, the constellations, again, in the background, uh, of the galaxy. Um, and they're the ones that actually gave us the so-called zodiac constellation, the 12 zodiac constellations. Um, and each constellation was not just a group of stars, but rather it was really a, a figure, uh, a god, for example, that stood in the sky having a direct impact on the affairs of human beings and the destinies and the future of the world at large. So we're going to see, uh, during this time, a new class of priests uh, that are not necessarily just concerned with carrying out ceremon ceremonial or religious ritual functions, but rather those are astronomer priests. Those are actually priests that spend significant amount of time observing the sky in order to predict the future, so they're also diviners, in other words. Uh, divination, you know, the, uh, the craft of trying to predict the future. But again, this is not just a craft based on simply um, going uh, through some form of mystical experience or dream or hallucination, but rather it's more uh, a craft based on the cycles of time based on the movement of celestial bodies on the sky, that is to say. So again, this is going to be a major preoccupation. So, from the perspective of the rulers of those empires, like the Neo-Babylonian Empire, they have now arrived to the key factor that is giving them now access to the workings of the universe. This is what they believe to be the real triumph of order over chaos, that is to say, that this chaotic world that was perceived in the past, as I explained in previous discussions, uh, the Mesopotamian worldview was very much based on this idea of chaos, and people were trying to find some form of order in society, order in nature. Now they said, well, we found it, that it, there is order at the very heart of creation, that the way that this universe was built and constructed was to work in a very synchronized fashion that is working very orderly. You can see the march of the sun and the moon every day. There's a specific cycle, again, across the year, that a certain number of days that make up one solar year, a certain amount of days that transpire to uh, produce what is called a full moon, for example, and a certain amount of days to produce eclipses as well. And you can mathematically predict them. Again, they happen mathematically, uh, very precisely at specific times, that is to say, uh, that you can actually predict in advance, and you can predict the effect that will come with it, you know, the effect that will come with the eclipse as well. So now, the gods of the Neo-Babylonians are not just gods of the mountain. Again, remember... The old, Babylonian, the old Babylonian, Akkadian, Assyrian, and Sumerian religions of the past were based on uh, the gods of the environment. Those religions, again, were devoted to the environment. All the gods and the goddesses were the environment. Now, they're shifting that idea to the sky. So now, the main gods of the Neo-Babylonians, and of course, from this point onwards, we're going to see, of course, uh, other civilizations picking up on, on those ideas as well, like the ancient Greeks and the Romans, for example, we're going to get to see that later on, is that they're now worshipping the sun, the moon, and the planets. They are the new gods, in other words. They are the ones actually ruling over the universe. They're the ones producing everything uh, here on earth. 
that affect animals and plants and humans and social events, political events. They're the ones ruling all of that in a very timely and ordered fashion as well. Now, this empire is going to try to reorganize human society according to the sky. So they notice that certain planets or certain celestial bodies are more present in each, in specific days, for example, in specific days. So they're going to create a small chart of uh, a cycle of time that encompasses seven days. You know, this is again producing what today we call the week, the seven day week, for example. Uh, in each day, there is a planet that is ruling over that day. Uh, Monday, for example, that's Monday. You know, think of Sunday. You know, that's the day of the sun. Sunday, for example. Saturn day, for example. Saturday. Uh, Friday is the day of Venus. Thursday, the day of Jupiter. Uh, Wednesday, the day of Mercury. And Tuesday, the day of Mars. Uh, and every day, humans are supposed to conduct certain activities, uh, certain work-related activities or political activities or religious activities, for that matter, that every day has been designated to uh, carry out certain human action, that is to say. So you can see how this is creating social order. Again, that human societies are now being synchronized with the cycles of time that are uh, governed by the planets, the moon, and the sun. Um, again, the year calendar is also born during this time. You know, this is made up of 12 months, the division of the solar year into 12 lunar months. That is also this idea that, well, we, we can fit in 12 lunar months inside of a solar year, and the astronomers were working, you know, in producing that as well. You know, this is the kind of uh, computation of time that today, uh, we use in the Western world, our Western calendar, the European uh, calendar, for example, and the entire Western hemisphere is governed by those Neo-Babylonian calendars, as a matter of fact. And of course, uh, uh, people were also trying to uh, predict the future of human beings by knowing the time, the specific time when a person was born. The, if the, the moon was in certain position, for example, or the sun, if there was an eclipse, or if you were born under the sign of the zodiac, for example, of the 12 zodiacs, again, uh, you will inherit or you will take on uh, a certain quality, certain trait, certain per personality that was uh, given to that person by the stars, that is to say, and you can uh, determine or predict uh, what that person was going to do in life, you know, and so on. Again, so again, this is going to be uh, one of the uh, characteristics of the Neo-Babylonians in their attempt to gain more control over nature, the environment, and human society. All right, so the other empires I want to discuss here um, is the um, Indo-European empires. Now, there were two Indo-European empires that flourished in the Near East, the Hittites uh, in Anatolia, and the other one was the Persian, Persian Empire, in what is today modern-day Iran. Now, uh, rather briefly, uh, let us look at the Hittites, and we explained the Hittites in the first session of this topic when we were talking about the Indo-Europeans um, migrating out of the Caucasus Mountains, for example, of southern Russia, and they're going to be moving in several directions. Some of them went into what is called Asia Minor or Anatolia. They settled there as early as 2700 BC, and they began to cre create a series of communities there in that region. Uh, by 1500, as we'll see, they were able to start building a massive uh, empire that stretched across this entire region uh, and it spanned for about three three centuries or so, by 1200 BC. I mean, the Hittite Empire is beginning to crumble at that time. Again, so they're Indo-Europeans. They're not to be confused with the other linguistic or ethnic groups of uh, Mesopotamia. They're coming from the Caucasus Mountain, and once again, as early as 2700 BC. And what really gave them uh, a, a great advantage uh, over their neighbors in terms of building a splendid war machine was that they discovered iron ore in that region of Asia Minor, 
And they started really working with, um, uh, with metal, again, with iron and cr crafting different kinds of iron tools. So in many, in many ways, they were really Iron Age pioneers. They started the Iron Age in that region, and that gave them an advantage uh, militarily because many of the tools that they were crafting were, were tools for military purposes. They started really advancing military technology, and they're going to create really uh, a war machine. Uh, you know, things like helmets, for example, swords uh, that were more deadly than the bronze swords of their neighbors in the region, for example. Uh, the, we, we talked about the uh, spike wheel and the, and the war chariot, for example. But most importantly, what really gave them a great advantage was the domestication of the horse, something that they borrow from other nomadic groups from Central Asia. You know, the, uh, nomad, the nomads of Central Asia had been really the forerunners of horse domestication, and they were domesticating horses for hunting purposes, but the Hittites domesticated the horse, learned how to um, tame it and use it, not only for uh, hunting purposes, but for military purposes as well. So there is a transformation in technology here. The horse, uh, from this time onward, will be considered a technology, a war-based technology, just like any other military technology is coming out of this uh, process. The war chariot, the spite wheel were used to provide more mobility for soldiers, and this is going to give them an edge, again, in trying to expand territorially uh, a thousandfold because now they're using the horse, they're using the chariot, and they can move uh, rather easily across communities, subdue them, and extract tribute from them, and this, they're building now a great empire starting around 1500 BC. Now, as they're building this empire, their Indo-European political structures are going to undergo change and transformation. Remember, their political structure of elected monarchy, you know, the monarchs were elected by the assembly of warriors. The Hittites are going to borrow uh, ideas from uh, Mesopotamia, from their neighbors, where the king uh, in Mesopotamia, like the Assyrian kings, the Babylonian, the Akkadians, they declare themselves to be living gods. So this is a divine monarchy. And the Hittites are going to borrow that idea from them. And they're going to, as they're creating this empire, now the king will no longer be just an ordinary ruler. He's going to be now a divine ruler from this point onwards, again, a living god. So there is an adaptation here. Now, the way they were trying to maintain and keep the empire together was by implementing a series of strategies, political strategies, otherwise known as overlordship and oaths of allegiance. What that means is that uh, the Hittites, in many cases, allowed certain leaders, regional leaders, to remain in power or in charge of certain localities. In other words, the Hittites uh, did not really remove all the local leaders and replace them necessarily with their own. Although in some instances they did that, in many cases they allowed uh, the, the local leaders that they conquered to remain in power, uh, to remain the overlords, that is to say, of their own region. Uh, however, they needed to swear an oath of allegiance to the emperor. Uh, they needed to present themselves in front of, in front of the emperor, uh, kneel before them, and swear the oath of allegiance that they were, you know, their vassals and so on to this great emperor, and they were to remain loyal and so on. You know, it was a ceremony, in other words. And by doing that, you know, the Hittites created bonds of loyalty and allegiance again across the empire. Okay, it was really again uh, a strategy that they devised. Now, the Hittites, because they were so mobile with their chariots and so on, um, they displaced uh, a great many groups from Asia Minor, you know, the place where they built their empire. And a lot of people, got in, a lot of nomadic groups got displaced. They ran away. Some of them actually came into Mesopotamia, 
while others actually came into Egypt, to the south. Again, so this is very important, how the Hittites, being nomadic at one point, transformed themselves into an empire, borrow ideas from other nomadic groups from Central Asia. They created this empire, but displaced other nomads that began to raid and invade the civilizations of the Near East. For example, the Egyptians were actually raided by a group of nomads, otherwise known as the Hyksos, who borrow some of the military skills and technologies of the Hittites, and they started invading um, Egypt uh, around 1600 BC, and they encountered a civilization that was already fragile and weak, it was crumbling, and by 1570, they took over uh, Egypt and uh, installed themselves as leaders. So again, this is a nomadic group displaced by the Hittites, uh, this empire that is now, uh, the, Hit, uh, the Hyksos are now uh, arriving to Egypt, taking over this river civilization, and they're going to change it, as we'll see once we move into the uh, section on Egypt. But uh, Egyptian civilization, civilization will be changed uh, soon thereafter because they were overtaken by the Hyksos again. So we can see repercussions, a ripple effect of how the nomads are creating changes across uh, uh, the Near East. Now, one of the main influences of the Hittites in this region was, of course, their military technologies and skills. Uh, all the other groups in the Near East, whether it's Mesopotamia, including Egypt, are going to learn and borrow many of the strategies, techniques, and military tools of the Hittites, and they're going to use them for their own purposes to build their own empires. So this is, again, uh, one of the most significant changes and consequences of the Hittite Empire is how they're going to actually lead to the rise of all the other empires in the region. There's another Indo-European that flourished in the Near East, and that is the Persian Empire. Uh, it flourished uh, uh, starting around 550, and it spanned all the way to 330 BC, when the Persian Empire fell, when Alexander the Great, the Greek uh, uh, Macedonian emperor, actually conquered them. But nonetheless, uh, this is an Indo-European uh, uh, empire, the Indo-Europeans began arriving to this region in what today is modern-day Iran uh, around 1500 BC. So the forerunners of the modern nation of Iran, again, are Indo-Europeans. They were known as the Indo-Aryans. Again, um, they were known, you know, one of the tribal groups that actually settled in this region were known as the Medes. Again, they're Indo-Europeans. Um, and they settled in that region, in the mountains of uh, Iran, and they built their communities. They were semi-nomadic. They engaged in all, uh, herding animals and also some farming. But by 550, as a result of uh, the Indo-Europeans in this region having absorbed many of the Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, <laughs> and Assyrian culture, uh, particularly the culture of empire, they're going to also rise to the top and actually seize the moment and take over the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Uh, and the person that is credited for uh, this uh, feat was Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great is going to be the founder of the uh, Persian Empire in 550 when he defeated the Neo-Babylonian forces took over ba the, the Babylonian city, and with that, he pretty much takes over the entire uh, Neo-Babylonian Empire, which was really the heir of the Assyrian Empire and the Akkadian Empire in the past. Again, those are, those are a sequence of empires that rise and fall continuously. So this is a, a vast uh, territorial domain that uh, included also portions of India to the west, uh, to the east, I'm sorry, to the east, we see the expansion of the Persian Empire to the east in present-day India. Uh, it integrated also Asia Minor, where the Hittite Empire uh, had uh, emerged, and also Egypt, 
will be overtaken also by the Persians as well. This was a vast imperial system at one point. And as we'll see later, again, the Persians also attempted to conquer the Greeks as well. There will be a great battle, uh, you know, to conquer the Greek world unsuccessfully, of course. But nonetheless, again, uh, this was a vast imperial system, perhaps the first uh, world's uh, uh, superpower, okay? Uh, it emerges in the ancient world. It preserves the Persian Empire, the Indo-European political structure, um, based on, once again, uh, elected monarchy, the assembly of warriors have significant say in the system, and so on. But uh, the Persians are going to innovate some new techniques, new institutions and strategies to maintain the empire together, because this was a vast geographical domain. So, for example, under the leadership of that, that Darius, Darius the first, uh, the the emperor Darius the first, uh, we see the introduction of a new political order within the Persian Empire, known as the satrapies. The satrapies was really a, the division of the Persian Empire into different provinces. Okay, a province or a satrapy, um, and each satrapy. Uh, was run or administered by a governor. So this is, you know, very similar to what today a country has, you know, in terms of states. You know, there's a national, of course, government, and of course there's a series of states. And each state is governed, of course, by a governor. Um, so it's very similar to, to that kind of system, again, but they were known as satrapies. And the governor will be collecting taxes, in his own region, he will be the supreme chief justice as well of that locality. Um, and he extracted tribute from the population and he sent some of that tribute to the emperor. And he also was allowed to keep some of the tribute for himself. So again, this really created a lot of uh, corruption within the system because many governors really tried to maximize the amount of tribute extracted uh, in, from the population uh, in order to enrich themselves. Again, the, the governors were known as the satraps, the satraps. They were running a, sat, a satrapy in this case. Okay, so this is the kind of political uh, uh, distribution or political structure of the Persian Empire. Um, now, the governors did not have any military power. They were deprived of controlling the armed forces for fear of... Uh, uh, them rebelling against the emperor, of course. <coughs> now, the Persian Empire also tried to keep the empire together by building roads, trying to connect every province, every town and city together with the core empire, again, with the core city um, in Persia. That will facilitate, of course, the payment of tribute. You transport, of course, tribute along those roads, but also trade, trade with other societies outside the empire. Remember, this is one of the characteristics of the Age of Empires is that it, the, the rise of long distance trade in order to increase their revenues. So again, this is uh, meant to increase the revenues, maximize the collection of tribute and so on uh, and for economic expansion. Now, another technique or strategy to create unity and cohesion in the empire uh, was the introduction of an official language. Um, again, this empire encompassed a multiplicity of different linguistic groups. There were a great number of different tribal groups, each with their own customs and traditions. And so that posed you know, a difficulty if you are trying to manage an empire so vast, so diverse, well, you need some form of uniformity. And so uh, the Persians introduced Aramaic in this, in this case as the official language of the empire. So all official matters, whether it were legal matters, political treaties, or economic transactions, the payment of tribute had to be conducted under Aramaic. So people, in many cases, had to be bilingual, speak their own tribal languages, but at the same time, learn the official language for official purposes. So that creates a standardized system, again, of uniformity across the empire. Also, 
uh, the Persians were known for creating what is called um, a system of spies, you know, uh, an intelligence gathering, so to speak, uh, system or, or, or institution in order to protect the empire from, let's say, incoming invasions, for example. Uh, so again, the emperor will send spies across the realm uh, to provide a report every now and then uh, regarding, for example, foreign armies, you know, going into the frontier to observe if there were any attacks, for example, or incursions into the Persian Empire, uh, or uh, to spy on the governors or the satraps, as they were called, to see if they were, you know, keeping order in their own satrapy as well. Now, another technique or strategy that they used was the introduction of a standard currency. You know, uh, the Persians were not really the first ones, you know, to actually introduce a standard currency. Uh, the Greeks and the Chinese were already uh, moving in this direction as well uh, around the same time. Again, so we see that in several places, uh, uh, in different civilizations, as they were becoming more and more imperialistic, one of the characteristics is that as empires arise, there was the need to create a standardized mon monetary system, a standardized currency, for commercial reasons, of course. Uh, that way you can engage in commercial trans transactions and trade and so on, and it will facilitate that trade if everybody accepts, of course, a mode of payment or currency. There's also, again, the introduction of weights and measures. Again, empires were also very well known for introducing a standardized method of weights and measures. That is to say that uh, if you are indeed engaging in, in commerce, uh, if you're buying grain and so on, well, uh, across the empire, it was agreed that if you're going to be buying grain, a bushel, for example, of grain, it was important that people were paying uh, the exact amount for what they were actually buying. So, uh, you know, if they were buying a bushel of wheat, for example, okay, it had to be measured, weighted, and people will have to pay accordingly again based on that weight and so on. Also for tribute purposes, if you're paying tribute to the emperor, a certain amount of products, well, it has to be weighted to be correct and to be exact as well, okay? So what's, what we see is very early on is the introduction of new systems that create a standardized uh, method for trade, commerce, for communication, for transportation, and that creates uniformity, that creates cohesion and unity, okay? Um, that was, again, innovated by the empires to maintain, again, those systems together. All right, the last empire I want to actually look at, again, is the Egyptian Empire, which stretched from the 1570s to 1075. Again, this is the time of the Hyksos, invasion. This group that was displaced by the Hittites uh, that came into Egypt, they have the Hittite technology, they had the chariot, for example, and they took over Egypt and ruled Egypt for a while. They installed themselves as pharaohs. Eventually, there's going to be a massive uprising against the Hyksos, and they were actually expelled out of Egypt. Now, the Hyksos invasion of, e of Egypt is going to have a profound effect on Egyptian civilization. Egyptian civilization will no longer be the same ever again. Remember, Egyptian civilization, if you remember, was a civilization almost devoted to religious goals and purposes. People working the land, you know, paying tribute to the gods, to the pharaohs, serving them in order to try to earn... Um, a reward in heaven, trying to cultivate virtue, and so on. And again, it was a very religious-oriented society. You know, everything that people did, uh, their work was all devoted to the gods, and the construction of temples and pyramids and the like. Everything had to do with the afterlife and with the spirit. But now, because they were invaded by this nomadic group, uh, after the Egyptians gained control once again of Egypt, the new dynasties that flourish afterwards are going to be more militaristic. We're going to see a new militaristic culture in Egypt, 
And the theocracy, this governing body of priests and pharaohs, are not going to be only concerned with priestly functions, uh, conducting ceremonies and the like, but they're going to be concerned with warfare. Again, so we see the rise of uh, war pharaohs, for example, or war kings in Egypt. Okay, uh, the, the idea was that, well, uh, in order to prevent a future invasion, Egypt has to defend itself. So we need a standing army, we need defense systems, and we need to use them. Not only to defend ourselves from incoming invasions, but we need to use those uh, armies uh, in order to march into the outside and subdue the barbarians, subdue the nomads in the eastern Mediterranean, for example, in the Near East and the like. To, pre to prevent them from actually coming over here and, and taking over once again. So there's going to be a massive expansionism of Egypt into Asia Minor, the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, they're trying to encroach upon the Near East, and also they're moving south of Egypt as well, in parts of Central Africa as well. Eventually, the Egyptians are going to clash with uh, the empires of Asia Minor, the Hittites, and there's going to be a major confrontation between those two superpowers. The Egyptians are a military power, the Hittites are a military power, and they clash over control of uh, Kadesh, which is present day, the present-day country of Syria. Uh, they both engage in this massive battle, the Battle of Kadesh. Uh, this battle was led by a pharaoh, Ramses II. He's leading the charge. He's the commander-in-chief, and you can see that this is now the age of empires that are now clashing with one another, of course, and they have similar technologies. This was the largest battle in the ancient world in 1275 BC. It was a draw. Uh, nobody actually won, of course, but nonetheless, you can see that we are entering a whole new era in world history, where, again, there's the clash of empires now. Okay. Uh, all right, so another, of course, very significant change that transpired in Egypt was the rise of slavery. Now, due to the fact that as the Egyptians were expanding into different areas, uh, like in the eastern Mediterranean, they're going to capture a lot of the peoples that were there, uh, the so-called barbarians or nomads, and they're going to uh, tr transfer those populations into Egypt to serve as slaves for the construction of new temples and roads and the like. This doesn't mean that the slaves build the pyramids. Again, the pyramids were not built by slaves. This is very important. The pyramids were not built by slaves. The pyramids that were built in the Old Kingdom were built by devotees, by people that were paying tribute to their pharaohs and the gods. But again, there's a change. With the rise of empires comes, of course, slavery as well. It's another change. Another significant change was the rise of monotheism. Egypt is now an empire and is ruled by a single individual, a pharaoh. And so as they're stretching their dominion far and wide in every direction, encompassing, of course, a multiplicity of different peoples, there was the need to create uniformity once again, a source of common identity where people can come together and worship a single god and create a sense of community, that is to say, because they're so diverse. So up to this time, it's very important to note that there were still a multiplicity of gods and goddesses that people prayed to because there were so many different tribal groups. Each god worshipped different gods and goddesses, and they believed in many, many gods. They really believed that the world was populated by a multiplicity of spirits and divinities and gods and so on. But here, there will be an Egyptian pharaoh that is going to try to undo that and introduce the notion that there's only one supreme being in creation and no other. In other words, that you know, this idea that there's a multiplicity of different spirits and beings, again, that is unreal, okay? Uh, trying to undo the tribal gods, again, of the people and introduce the worship of a universal god because, again, the, the, the empires really introduce the idea of universals, okay? Uh, the empire is the universe. This is the entire world and is ruled by a single person, so therefore the universe must be ruled by a single being as well. And so Akhenaton 
was that pharaoh that ruled Egypt from 1353 to uh, 1336 BC, who tried to institute monotheism by uh, proposing that there was only one God in the universe, and that was the sun God, and that really covers the entire world. Okay, what greater God than the sun, he said. Again, this is the only God, is the giver of life. He's giving us uh, abundance and crops. He's given us sustenance, health. Uh, it provides heat and so on. And again, everybody is uh, influenced by the sun God. So therefore, this is the only supreme being. In doing that, he erected new uh, temples to the sun God and abolish all the other cults. Again, he really went against all the other gods of the Egyptian pantheon, canceled those cults, and instead forced people to actually worship only the sun. Now, that was not a very wise, let us just say, policy because uh, he really angered his own people. Uh, people began to uh, see Akhenaton as a tyrant. You know, he was smashing uh, the deities, the gods of the people, closing their temples, and people did not like that at all, of course. It was very hard for people to detach from their customs and, and, and beliefs that they have held for many, many generations. So, um, he also angered the priest. Uh, the priests that were in charge of those cults were also very, very angry at, at Akhenaton because they were benefiting, of course, from the collection of tribute, the collection of the gifts that people confer to the gods. And the, preach, the priests were enriching themselves you know, in this process, and also the priests began to plot against Akhenaton. Uh, finally, uh, he lost power when news got to Egypt that there were foreign armies. Uh, there were Syrian, again, uh, armies marching into Egypt, waiting to inv invade Egypt. And at that moment of crisis, uh, his own people turned uh, their back on him. Um, uh, they were unwilling to fight uh, because they were, of course, very enraged at, the, at his policies of trying to institute a single cult, of course. And that forced him to actually uh, step down, and he had to resign, and he left power, you know, uh, in, in misery. As a matter of fact, again, this is the, uh, the the inscription of the Egyptian pharaoh worshiping uh, the sun god. He called Aten. Aten was again the supreme being of the universe, creator of all the universe, and so on. Uh, but it was a failed attempt once again at instituting monotheism. Uh, in, in the ancient world. His successor, his son-in-law, Tutankhamun, uh, uh, took over the throne, and he reversed all the policies of Akhenaton altogether. Uh, Tutankhamun pretty much restored the old gods, the old practices, and abolished, of course, the cult of Aten, and people were very happy, and he became a celebrity, pretty much, due to the fact that he pretty much restored uh, the the old order, the old religious order. Now, this last segment is going to deal with uh, the Hebrews. This is another nomadic group that is also have is going to have a great impact uh, in shaping the ancient world as well as we'll see, uh, particularly as they attempted to introduce monotheism. And just like Akhenaton, we're going to see a more successful attempt at bringing about monotheism in the ancient world. Now, the Hebrews started out as a nomadic group, and their uh, role in creating monotheism took place in the context of this nomadic group transitioning into civilization. So it is their transition into civilization that moved the Hebrews to start formulating monotheism for the purpose of maintaining uh, ethnic identity and solidarity as well, and, and also to maintain their civilization as well. So let's look first and foremost at their nomadic background. Again, they're nomads. They're coming out of Mesopotamia, southern Mesopotamia. It was, was once uh, southern Sumerian the Sumerian civilization. 
uh, there's a Semitic in origin, uh, meaning that they belong to this Semitic linguistic group that branched out of Africa. Uh, if you remember, we, we talked about the uh, Semitic group came, uh, came out of Africa and moved into the Middle East and branched out into a series of different tribal groups like the Akkadians, the Assyrians, the, you know, the Arabs, for example, the Babylonians, and so on. They share the similar Semitic, again, uh, uh, linguistic background. Uh, so the, the Hebrews are no exception. They're Semitic in origin. Uh, and they start out uh, as a pastoralist. Again, from their own records, it should be noted here that uh, the information that we have available about the history of the ancient Hebrews comes from their own writings, uh, their own biblical religious writings, the old, what is today the Old Testament, for example, the Hebrew Bible. That is really what we use as uh, records of uh, their movements and their transition to civilization and the, the rise of monotheism as well. So they start out in southern Samaria as uh, pastoralists, they're herding sheep, they're moving it from place to place, and this is their mode of subsistence. And from time to time, of course, they trade some of their animals for other products with the Sumerian cities. So there is some interaction between the Hebrews and the Sumerians. And within that interaction, the Hebrews are going to absorb significant cultural ideas from the Sumerians as well. And this is very important because there's relationships, because there's trade between those two. There is a cultural you know, sharing and borrowing of cultures, if you will. Okay. Now, their social structure, how their society was structured, they have a tribal structure. Now, this is a tribe, in other words. And in the tribe, uh, as any other tribes around the world, uh, the basis of society is kinship. Again, that people are related to one another. People that uh, live in a tribe, they are connected to every member in familial links and connections to one another. It's supposed to be an extended family group. That's what a tribe is, is an extended family group or kinship. That is to say, uh, people are related to one another based on birth. You're born into the tribe or you got married Again, or in many cases, you got adopted as well. Uh, but for the most part, uh, their tribal structure is based mostly on this idea that you know, you're born into the tribe as well. You share common ancestors. You share common history. You can actually say, well, we all go back to a single ancestor who was really the forerunner of the tribe and so on. Now, the tribe... It's composed of a series of families, of course, that travel together. They are a tribe. And the male figure is actually central to the family and the tribe at large, meaning that it is really the male that is the head of the family. And also the chief of the tribe is also a male. This is what is called patrilineal. This is a patrilineal society in which the father is really the ruler, the, the leader of the family and the tribe at large, and people keep the last name of the fa father's line of the family as well. It is the father's line of the family that counts in terms of leadership, in this case, in terms of leadership. Okay. Now, this tribal group goes back in time and makes connections to a patriarch, uh, one of the forerunners or tribal chiefs of the Hebrews, uh, whose name was Abraham, who lived, give and take, according to estimates, uh, about 2000 BC thereabouts. Again, that's really just a calculation, 2000 BC, Abraham. He was really the leader of the Hebrews, the patriarch, the father figure of the entire tribe as early as 2000 BC. And again, uh, the Hebrews connect you know, their lineage, their tribal ancestry back to Abraham, that is to say. Uh, he is uh, reported to have lived in one of the Sumerian cities of southern Mesopotamia, the city of Ur, in this case. And he was not, as I will explain in just a few moments, just an ordinary tribal leader, 
but he was also considered to be a spiritual guide and also a prophet as well. We're going to get to see that portion in just a few seconds here. Now, this tribal uh, society, this tribal structure does not have a permanent or stable political system in the nomadic stage. It had a council of elders composed of all the uh, males that were the heads of each family that will assemble from time to time in order to discuss issues or problems affecting the, the, the tribe, you know, like well, migration or, you know, uh, whether they needed to leave a city or engage in trade, etc., you know, matters of warfare as well. They will convene and just engage in talks, you know, in order to discuss problems. So, again, this was not really a permanent or even stable, you know, political institution, the so-called Council of Elders and Judges as well, as it, as it was called, Council of Elders and Judges. Now, in terms of the religion, um, the Hebrews started out very early on endorsing or following an animistic religious worldview. Just like literally every nomadic pastoralist hunter-gatherer group around the world conceived the world as a place populated by spirits. Okay, So the Hebrews started out that way, again, once upon a time, before they developed monotheism, this idea of one God, they believed in many gods as well. They believed in spirits. They even believed in some of the gods of the ancient Sumerians as well because they were, again, very much influenced by summer as well. However, they had a major tribal god. Uh, it was a sky god. You know, He was called Yahweh. Uh, this is very common among all the nomadic groups in the world. The nomads that are moving from place to place are guided by the sky. And because the sky is their main form of orientation, therefore it becomes, again, their god. You know, this, this is true for the Mongols of Northern Asia, this is true for the Arabs, this is true for the Aztecs. Uh, you can go case by case, the Indo-Europeans also worship a sky god as well. And they also borrow and absorb certain ideas from Mesopotamia as well. There's a certain Mesopotamian influence in their religious beliefs to the point that they adopt some of the creation stories of uh, ancient uh, summer, for example. You now, the creation myths, how the world was created, for example. You know, the story, for example, of Adam and Eve you know, is very important. Uh, we associate Adam and Eve with the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, but in fact, uh, those myths were myths that were reworked by the Hebrews from earlier Sumerian myths that go back to 4000 BC. So again, as early as 4000 BC, we see myths in ancient summer about a paradise where the first gods started creating humanity, for example, and how one of the gods actually disobeyed the orders of the goddesses and ate from forbidden fruits and he was sentenced to death you know uh, by the goddesses and ultimately the goddesses healed Enki one of those gods uh, by creating other goddesses that healed his rib for example and gave him life by healing his rib for example of course the Hebrews reward that story and created the story of Adam and Eve where you know Adam is created first and out of his rib Eve is created, of course. So there's a reformulation of an earlier Sumerian myth. You can see that. And of course, the myth of the flood. We discussed, for example, in the second topic, the, uh, the story of Gilgamesh. You know, it talks about the flood, for example, you know, the gods and the flood and kill humanity and spared, again, uh, just uh, one couple, a family. Uh, the Hebrews also reworked that and gave us the flood, again, Noah's Ark and the like, etc. Et again, so there is a direct religious influence by uh, Sumeria on the Hebrews as well. Now, Abraham, who was actually the patriarch, uh, the common ancestor of this uh, uh, nomadic group, was not only the tribal leader, but he was also a spiritual guide. He was in contact with Yahweh, the 
uh, Sky God, and uh, he's going to, as we'll see, introduce the notion that there was only one God and no other God whatsoever. So he's going to be really the founder of monotheism for the Hebrews. He is really the founder of monotheism. Um, in the story of the Bible, it is told that Abraham began to enter direct communication with Yahweh, and he engaged in an agreement or pact or covenant with uh, Yahweh. You know, the covenant, the famous covenant with Abraham, again, uh, that is told in the Bible, uh, Yahweh's covenant with Abraham. And the covenant was this, that um, Abraham was told by Yahweh that, look, there's only one God, and that's Yahweh, of course, that's, that's, that's God, him. Um, and as long as the Hebrews maintained their connection and loyalty with this one supreme being and abandoned all the other spirits and gods and goddesses that they, they believe in, that Yahweh was going to bless uh, the Hebrews with prosperity and with land, that they will no longer be nomadic, they will be given land to settle and that they will multiply like the stars and build a great civilization that will enjoy prosperity, happiness, and the like. With the promise that the Hebrews needed to maintain their connection with Yahweh. In other words, that this was the covenant or the pact. So from this time onwards, the Hebrews see themselves as the chosen people. They have been chosen to be led to a promised land. They are trying to find what the promised land is, the, the land of milk and honey and abundance, where they're going to settle and actually create a civilization, okay? So this is the very first instance where, you know, we see in the Bible the introduction of monotheism and it's introduced by Abraham, okay? Now, of course, now from this time onwards, the Hebrews are in search of the promised land. They're on a pilgrimage. They're trying to find it. And finally, they arrive to the Eastern Mediterranean about 1800 BC uh, to the land, land of Canaan, as it was called, okay? And this is going to be uh, interpreted as the promised land, okay? Uh, this, this region of the Eastern Mediterranean, as you can see in this, in this map. Let me just show it, okay? So they settled. And they start to occupy different regions, okay? They are dispersed now. They're not all concentrated in a single area. There's some uh, groups that move to the north, others in the middle of it, others to the south. And while they're there, of course, they're going to be also influenced by the Indo-Europeans to the north, the Hittites. They're going to borrow certain Hittite uh, cultural features like metal works, for example. They're going to also domesticate the horse, cattle, and they're beginning to use it for transportation purposes, for agriculture, and they're beginning to form settlements. They're no longer necessarily nomadic. They're beginning to settle. Again, this is the very first time that they're beginning to establish a settled community, that is to say. Now, the northern... The northern uh, tribes are going to be far more influenced, of course, by the Hittites. The southern tribes uh, will experience a certain disruption about 1700 BC when they were struck by famine. So the southern tribes are going to leave that region of the eastern Mediterranean and they're going to migrate into Egypt. Again, they're in search for sustenance or food. They're going to enter Egypt. They are very well aware that there is a civilization there that has, of course, uh, agricultural production and abundance. And initially when they arrive, uh, the situation is not very clear whether they were received uh, or welcomed uh, with open arms or not. But what we know is that over time, as the Egyptian civilization transformed itself into an empire, um, the Egyptians are going to take the Hebrew tribes captive and force them to work for the Egyptians as slaves, in other words, okay? So they got trapped, again, in, in Egypt. Uh, that, that's one way of putting it, okay? And they remain, you know, enslaved for centuries until, of course, there will be another figure arising in his, the, his, the history of the Hebrews. 
his name was Moses, uh, that is going to uh, liberate the Hebrews from, uh, from Egypt, and he's going to follow on the footsteps of Abraham of becoming more than just a guide, more than just a liberator, but he's going to become like a prophet. He's going to maintain direct communication with Yahweh, and he's going to be instrumental in reviving monotheism for the Hebrews once again. So this is the so-called famous Exodus. The Exodus, again, is when Moses liberated the Hebrews from Egypt, and he returned those tribal groups back to the eastern Mediterranean, back to the Promised Land. And they wandered there for 40 years uh, until there was a uh, uh, critical moment in that uh, uh, migration um, they were so, somewhat lost again in the wilderness and the moment comes when uh, Moses had a personal mystical experience with Yahweh this is the moment when he ascends to Mount Sinai and he has a revelation an encounter with Yahweh, and Yahweh gives uh, uh, Moses the Ten Commandments, no, tablets, those were actually tablets, with the Ten Commandments, to be given to the Hebrews as the new law. Again, in a law that was going to reinforce, once again, Abraham's covenant, again, uh, with Yahweh. That is to say, reinforce monotheism, because up to this point, still the Hebrews, although... They still worked, I mean, they continue worshiping Yahweh. They were still very much worshiping other gods and other spirits and so on because it was very common, again, for people living during this time. This was to be a new ethical code, Ten Commandments for, for people to follow. Uh, is Those were actually codes of moral virtue and behavior, how people needed to behave with one another, like don't kill, don't steal, and so on. You know, um, and keep loyalty with Yahweh, the one God, and so on. Honor your parents, etc. Again, to maintain a stable society. They don't prescribe necessarily punishment, but again, it's a guide for ethical behavior. Again, those are again the Ten Commandments. Uh, he descends from Mount Sinai and gives the commandments to the people. And this is going to become the new law. The new law of the land is this religious law. This is very important. It's like a new constitution, if you will. Now that they have settled, they have to abide by certain rules, by certain codes, and those are religious in nature and given directly uh, from God. Okay. Now, starting around the 1200s, now that the southern tribes have returned back to the eastern Mediterranean, we see a tribal division of land in the eastern Mediterranean. The Hebrews divide themselves into 12 tribes. 12 tribes, each uh, administered, governed by a tribal leader, each controlling specific areas or territories of the eastern Mediterranean. Again, so there's a tribal division, again, of land. Now, now that they have settled there, they're trying to move now to civilization. Okay, so from settlers to civilization. There's going to be a transition from being just settlers. Remember, they come out from being nomadic to now settled. And now from being settled and forming their first, you know, communities, etc., they're trying to now rise to the top again uh, to, civilize, to civilize life as well, uh, to build cities and the like. So the very first stepping stone was to build a confederation system, a system of alliances. All the tribal leaders are coming together initially and forming an alliance for defense purposes because, you know, geographically, this region is surrounded by superpowers. You know, there's the Egyptians to, to, the, to the west, uh, uh, in the north, you know, we have the Hittites, for example. They're on the way out by this time, of course. Um, but again, to the east, we have the... Uh, the Mesopotamian empires, okay, you know, the Akkadians, the Assyrians, we're going to see, of course, uh, the Babylonians and the like. So they're going to be surrounded by superpowers, so they need some form of uh, political unity. So the confederation system was born. At a local level, uh, they were ruled by judges, you know, because every judge was to administer the law 
given to Moses by God. So it's religious law. The judges initially were just political figures governing at the community level or town level uh, in order to determine who was right, who was wrong, based on the, the religious law. Okay. Uh, during this time, again, the tablets given to Moses were placed on a on a on a box. It was uh, it was called the Ark of the Covenant, uh, a sacred box that contained again the revelation of God. It was considered sacred because it contained the essence of Yahweh, and it was trans transported from place to place. It was, again, one of the most sacred uh, uh, features of the Hebrews during this time. Now, at some point, the Hebrews want civilization. They want to be on a par with the Egyptians and everybody else. They want cities and the like, uh, a high culture. And one way that they're trying to achieve this is by unifying all of the 12 tribes under one king. So they want a kingdom. Again, the kingdom, the kingdom of the Hebrews in this case. So uh, the, Bible, the Bible says that they petition, of course, uh, you know, Yahweh with you know, a, a king. Uh, Yahweh gives them a king. Saul, for example, was the first king. So it's a united kingdom now. Uh, after that comes David and after David, Solomon. And as we'll see after Solomon, you know, the monarchy got split. But nonetheless, during this very brief period of monarchy, we see now the Hebrews creating a civilization. We're going to see the building of cities, temples. There is trade. And of course, this is now the land of milk and honey. There is now, of course, a lot of wealth being created, prosperity and the like. Again, so this is the kind of golden age for the Hebrews, you know, the time of the monarchy for that matter. Now, after Solomon, uh, unity could not be maintained. Suddenly, the monarchy got split, and now we see two different kingdoms. The kingdom of Israel to the north, composed of 12 tribes, uh, 10 tribes, I'm sorry, and the kingdom of Judah, composed of two tribes to the south. Again, so it, it was a divided kingdom. There are two monarchs ruling each kingdom, north and south. Now, during this time, the Hebrews had a lot of, really, uh, struggle maintaining their civilization. They have a monarchy divided, their kingdom is divided, and they need to provide some form of unity, if you will, a common identity, a sense of community. And their struggle to maintain their civilization that was distinct from all the others was that, first and foremost, uh, people continued to pray and worship a multiplicity of gods. Many, in many cases, are foreign gods. They're the gods of other cultures or foreign cultures. So this creates a problem because, you know, one way to create a uniform uh, identity among the Hebrews was by uniting people under a single cult, the cult of one single supreme being, Yahweh. But still, People are not only divided politically, they're also divided religiously as well. Again, there's a multiplicity of different beliefs. There's another problem, and the problem is that they're constantly invaded, raided, and displaced by their neighbors, the empires, the superpowers that are constantly sending armies to attack one another. And in the process, the Hebrews are caught in, in, the, as a, in the crossfire of warring empires. You know, for example, in 722, the Assyrian Empire conquered the kingdom of Israel to the north, and it took the ten tribes captive, and from that point onwards, those ten tribes got lost in time. No one knows what actually happens to them. And this gave us the famous 12, uh, the ten lost tribes of Israel. Okay? So great displacement, you know, at that moment. In 587, the Babylonians conquered the southern uh, kingdom of Judah, uh, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, send, of course, an army, and they take the population captive uh, to Babylon. Again, so the Hebrews of Judah were taken captive, and they were taken captive to live as slaves in the city of Babylon, and they destroyed the temple of Solomon as well. Again, there was a temple that King Solomon actually built. It was a splendid temple, and that temple got utterly destroyed as well. Again, so there are significant challenges for the Hebrews to maintain their ethnic identity and their civilization in the face of, again, polytheism on one hand, but also constant invasions. So 
what was the strategy, what tool, what device the Hebrews innovated to sustain their identity and civilization? Two, monotheism on one hand and a prophetic tradition on the other. Again, we're going to see the rise of the prophets. Just on the line of Abraham and uh, Moses, we're going to see a series of prophets uh, arising from time to time, like Samuel, uh, Isaiah, Elijah, uh, Ezekiel, for example, that were trying to develop a national religion. Again, to maintain people together, you know, despite the fact that they were being dispersed, you know, that they wanted to foster monotheism, remind people that there was a covenant with Yahweh. In other words, look, we really need to uh, be very clear that we have a pact with Yahweh. You know, that we need to maintain our loyalty only to Yahweh. And this is going to be the source of our unity, in other words. You know, our tribal God is going to be the source of our ethnic identity and also our unity as well. Okay? And the prophet Isaiah, more than all the others, is the one that actually finally makes it very clear that it's through monotheism that the Hebrews were going to maintain their distinct culture, identity, and also civilization. Again, so Isaiah is credited for really uh, uh, being the one that actually uh, sealed, if you will, the pact uh, or the covenant that Abraham had established. Um, and the prophets also served the purpose of reminding people that all of those calamities that they were suffering from, the invasions, the displacement, the captivity, the enslavement, again, were actually divine punishment for breaking the covenant as well. So they were really interpreting all calamities as, well, you know, this is happening to us because you know, we're not really abiding by the, uh, by the pact, if you will. They started writing, of course, uh, all the events uh, that occurred uh, to the Hebrews. And this is where, again, the Bible is going to come from. Eventually, the Hebrew Bible was written from 800 to 300 BC, there were a series of writings by the prophets that by 300 BC, all of those writings are going to be compiled, of course, eventually under uh, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, again, so during this time, again, there is an attempt to compile the Bible. First, the Torah uh, was compiled. Those were the, uh, the books uh, that Moses uh, wrote, the five books, the first five books of the Old Testament deal with Moses and uh, the Hebrews uh, going into Egypt, you know, being liberated, and of course the commandments and the like, again, the Torah. This is the very first uh, time that we see the Hebrews really trying to have a religious scripture that talks about their own history, you know, the history of the tribe and their relationship with Yahweh. And again, this is something that happens around the Babylonian captivity. Uh, Deuteronomy as well, was a series of religious laws based on the laws of Moses that were also written during the Babylonian captivity in order to advise the Hebrews how to behave and uh, preserve their ethnic identity in the face of being taken captive and prisoners into another city. Again, so those religious laws that served the Hebrews to remain loyal to their God and in that, of course, they're preserving their distinct uh, uh, culture and identity as well. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel is the one that during the Babylonian captivity uh, writes, of course, uh, uh, a story, the story of Job, for example, that is a microcosm, really, of what happened to the Hebrews at large. This is, again, a person, Job, that was very fa faithful to Yahweh. He was following the commandments and the like. But he suffered all sorts of punishments. He suffered displacement. He suffered sickness. He suffered family catastrophes, death and famine and the like. And at some point he said, you know, why is this happening to me? He actually asked God, why is this really happening to me? What have I done? How is it that we're told to believe in a God that is the source of all good when there's evil in the world, in other words? This is what the Hebrews were actually asking themselves at this point. Why is it that evil happens sometimes in the world to people that actually have faith and believe in a single God? How can one God be the source of good and the source of evil? So again, here in the story, what Ezekiel is actually saying is that God answers Yahweh that, look, there's a divine plan. 
You know, everything that happens happens for a reason. What you call evil are just, you know, lessons that are trying to teach people moral virtue, you know, to perfect themselves, to perfect their moral character, to perfect their, uh, their relationship with God. Uh, and again, to become better humans, in other words, you know, more perfected. Uh, so again, uh, the, the story really is trying to justify monotheism. What Ezekiel is trying to say is that monotheism, you know, it's just the reality, again, of the universe, that there's only one God and everything that happens in the world, all the evil and the catastrophes, is just God trying to work out a plan in order to perfect humans, in other words, okay? Uh, so it is really what is called divine justice, okay? So once again, we see the prophets trying to institute and reassert monotheism as a way for the Hebrews to come together and bond with one another and preserve their unique and distinct ethnic identity and culture. Now, eventually, uh, the Hebrews will be liberated in 538 BC. Uh, they're going to be returning to the Promised Land. They're going to uh, rebuild the temple during this time. And from 538 to 333 BC, they're going to compile the Bible. In other words, they're going to assemble all the writings of the prophets, uh, Moses, the religious laws, and they're going to compile the Bible, and the Bible will be their constitution. This is a period when they were ruled by priests. The Hebrews were ruled by priests. They used the book, the holy book, that is to say, as the law for uh, guiding human behavior to guide the destinies of the Hebrew peoples, again, now in the Promised Land. Now, the contributions, again, of the Hebrews to world civilization is that they're the ones that finally not only innovated, but instituted monotheism, again, in the world, uh, and prophecy as well, to the point that monotheism will serve as the basis for the world religions that are coming afterwards that are going to dominate large sections of humanity, for example, Christianity and Islam. Christianity and Islam derive directly from the Hebrew lineage of prophets and traditions, if you will. Going back to Abraham, for example, uh, and the prophets as well, again, the idea of one single God. Also, another contribution to world civilizations is that the Hebrews invented history. You know, the idea for the Hebrews to actually be writing about the history of their own tribe and what happened to them, their migrations, and all the calamities and invasions and the like, was driven by religion. Yes, it's true, you know, but in reality, this is leading to the craft of history, of trying to understand historical events, trying to gain an understanding of them, and the Hebrews, what they're actually uh, coming to terms with is that by doing that, you're pretty much learning about what lessons Yahweh or God is imparting on them. They're writing about history because they're trying to record the lessons, again, of God. Again, today we're simply calling, you know, history the lessons of history. But for the history, for the Hebrews, uh, this was, again, the lessons of Yahweh. In other words, that everything that happened in the past was a lesson and they're trying to learn from them. Okay, okay. so last but not least, the summary points as we approach the end of this topic. What we have learned so far from this uh, topic is that, first and foremost, the significance of the environment in producing the nomadic migrations around the world in the ancient world. Again, this environmental change that occurred uh, around 3000 BC, uh, perhaps even earlier, uh, you know, get, got the nomadic groups, particularly those in the uh, uh, Caucasus Mountains, again, of southern Russia, to start moving out of that region and moving into different areas of the world. You know, that gave us, of course, you know, the settlements and invasions of the Near East and some of the migrations into Asia as well. The nomadic invasions changed the river civilizations of Mesopotamia and Egypt. As those civilizations got invaded by the nomads, we're going to see that the cultures of those civilizations got changed. Suddenly, those civilizations are adopting the skills, the techniques, the military equipment of the nomads, and they're becoming more and more militaristic. 
we, this, we see the rise of militarism, again, in the ancient world, that gave us, for example, the first warring cities in the, uh, in the Near East, like uh, the city of Akkad, Babylon, you know, Ashur, Ashur, for example, and of course the Egyptian civilization as well. Um, and of course, eventually the empires, you know, it's not just a matter of cities becoming more warlike, but expansionism, you know, we see the process of imperialism now, war machines, in other words, standing armies are now marching and expanding far and wide, incorporating diverse groups, diverse populations, and building large imperial systems controlled by one city, ruled by one emperor. In turn, the creation of those imperial systems led those empires and emperors the need to innovate new mechanisms for social control. In other words, that the empires were just so vast to control that they needed to innovate, for example, you know, mechanisms for social control. For example, universal laws, universal legal codes that will apply for everybody, standard currencies, for example, weights and measures, for example, building of roads, you know, um, we talked about that quite thoroughly. Uh, the introduction of, for example, uh, uh, governors in provinces and so on, oaths of allegiance, for example, you know, and the like. Uh, and, and also, you know, the need to innovate universal religions. This is the rise of the universal religions. Again, in world history, for the first time, there's the need to create a common sense of identity, a common sense of community by developing a, a, a single cult, the worship of a single supreme being that everybody must follow, and with that you create, of course, stability and order. We looked at all of that quite thoroughly uh, in this uh, topic, and uh, this is, again, what we have covered so far. Uh, this is all I have for you. This is the end of the third topic. We'll see you in the next topic coming next. Thank you.